How do you start the webinar? It's going. It's going already? Yeah, it's going already. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to this inaugural session of the New School and LPE Night Schools. Uh, I'll say our chief, uh, my colleague Noah Rosenblum, will say a bit more about the series and what LPE is. But I just want to welcome you, uh, all of you here to the New School. Um, this series is sort of a part of us trying to build, at a very, very nascent level, a uh, law uh, program at the New School. It's at the undergraduate level, there is a law minor, some of you are here who have taken that. Um, and it's hopefully we can grow around that and this series is part of that process and then that. So thank you very much for coming. Um, and I'll call Nor Rosenblum from NYU Law School um, and he can tell us a bit more about the series and about LPE project, which is our collaborators. So I'm delighted to welcome you for the first of an ongoing series of evening conversations, what we're calling Night School, a collaboration between the New School for Social Research and in particular the law program Cindy Bdo mentioned, the Law and Political Economy Project and LPENYC. I won't tell you too much more about LPE because that's part of what you've come here to talk about this evening. I just wanna flag for you that there will be a series of talks like this covering other major topics in the law for non-lawyers. So if you are a lawyer or a law student, we're delighted to have you, but the target audience of this night school series is people in New York, or I guess joining us in the webinar, not in New York, who are aware of the way in which law is shaping their lives and their projects and want to think about it more critically and more in depth without necessarily having the technical training of being a legal professional. Part of what we'll be talking today is what that technical training does and why it might be good to think about it more critically. Um, I believe our next session is already scheduled. We'll circulate an announcement about it, but you can look forward to one per month. There are lots of other projects connected with LPE NYC, including reading groups and various other activities. If you like what is happening this evening and you're not otherwise connected with us, come find me after the talk or check out our website. If you Google LPE NYC, you can find us and join the mailing list. So to tell us more about law and political economy, we have uh, two speakers, um, hard to imagine anyone better, we're joined today by the executive director of the Law and Political Economy Project, Corinne Blaylock. Corinne is a lawyer and a critical theorist, and for the last several years has been helping build out this exciting project. Uh, Corinne will be in conversation with Professor Amy Kapczynski of the Yale Law School. Um, the Law and Political Economy Project was created, founded, um, in a seminar that Amy originated and continues to teach at Yale. Amy is one of the faculty directors of the project and has been uh, a, a major intellectual force behind its growth and development. Um, for this exciting conversation, we have as a moderator, the New School's own Sandipto Dasgupta will be able to walk us through some of the questions, puzzles, and prospects for law and political economy. So with that, let me turn it over to Sandipto. Thanks, Noah. Um... So the idea is we do have a conversation, moderate conversation amongst Corinne uh, and Amy for about 45 minutes uh, or 65 minutes. Uh, and then we'll have a uh, stretch of time for questions. That's the main idea. We want to have questions from you. So hope we'll have a uh, conversation amongst ourselves and open it up uh, for questions. So, um, so let me start with sort of a very basic question which I think Noah raised is that. This is a series for non-lawyers uh, to have some sense of law, how it operates, what it does. Um, so the first question is, why should non-lawyers even care about law? Why is law worth caring about? 
Great. Um, thank you so much for sharing the beautifully with us and for having us here um, to organize it, uh, this main school. I um, I love being in a room talking to people who are not necessarily lawyers. I mean, I teach you know, lawyers to be, but this is like way more fun and interesting. Um, and I'm really excited to get some part where we hear from, from you all. But just to start off, so why do non lawyers care about law? Um, I think that, you know, that question, I want to unpack that question a little bit because I think it isn't. Um, uncommon. People normally like, understand law has an effect, right? Law comes at the end of a barrel of a gun, right? You know that if you get arrested, you have a lawyer, right? Um, that law matters. And I think that maybe one thing that we might get into, and I know we'll talk about later, is sort of um, maybe another way of thinking about that question, which is, you know, why would it matter to engage with law in any way other than just sort of rejecting it, overcoming it, ignoring it? Um, uh, thinking about this this morning and thinking, is this a sort of love like the bad boyfriend? Like, you know, like you don't, you don't try to change the bad boyfriend. You don't, you don't, you don't stick with the bad boyfriend. You just, just send the bad boyfriend away. You just you get rid of it, right? And I think the legitimate question and one that we should think about and talk about because for organizers, often law is the bad. For many people, law is just a, a negative force in their lives in in, in any very easy way of respect. Um, but I, I thought I would talk about sort of how I came to engage in this other way, like, like actually wanting to engage with law in a more constructive fashion, think about legal ideas, um, and use law to try to challenge power in certain ways. Um, because I think that's sort of I my answer about why, in fact, it sometimes makes sense to get inside of law and legal ideas and try to change law. Um, so the, the, the issue that really, um, actually when, before I came in, went to law school, that got me interested in law was um, working on access to medicines. I, in 1989, um, I was working um, with uh, um, an organization that provided uh, services to people with HIV in London. And it, this was around the time that medicines became available in the rich world. Uh, and I was writing reports for all of our members about how you know the HIV epidemic has really exploded um, in places like South Africa. One in five adults had HIV, and there were essentially no access to medicines, which are life saving if you take them. Come to come to um, and yet medicines cost ten thousand dollars, fifteen thousand dollars a year. There was no way that they would have been made available, um, despite this sort of incredible immensity and a human toll of this disease, and yet. Working with this organization, and we were running seminars for people about sort of how do you go back to work after you've had a promosis? I mean, how do you rebuild your life? And um, so I also, um, more or less, through social networks, because I was a young queer person, got involved in a faith activist. Um, and when I came back to the States, we were working on this precise question. And it was the activists who taught me, like, hey, those medicines don't cost $10,000 or $15,000 your care to make. They cost them much because. Companies hold patents. And so, what are patents? Patents are given by the government. It's a legal right that allow you as a company to say nobody else can make this thing. I invented it. Actually, they didn't invent it. Often, somebody in some government, you know, who funded research study actually really did the early work, but they have the rights and they can prevent other people. So, those same drugs that were being sold for ten thousand, fifteen thousand dollars a year became, over the course of this campaign for access, could be made for now they're less than a hundred dollars. Right. And so the difference between $100, at which you could start to build programs that really deliver truth, so there's like many issues there, but it was really about just this legal entitlement, right? Like, were there patents? And and, how, and and so, of course, it became very urgent to sort of figure out, like, what are these things? How do we have them? What do you do about them? And it turned out there were a whole other host of legal questions after that, right? So, um, South Africa, the government at the time, wanted to override those things and say, like, okay, great, we know maybe there's drugs that are available. We could buy them from India, we face a lot of generic drugs, um, and uh, try to invoke a law. The pharmaceutical industry sued them. Actually, sued Nelson Mandela, who was the, the, the person they chose to sue. Um, and uh, and so everybody working in the had become very kind of uh, immediately sort of uh, up to speed. I'm like, what are you going to do that? Turns out there are international treaties that the industry said, no, you can't do that because it's international treaty. Turns out that's not a treaty. 
So again, like the whole set of legal questions emerged, and it was really like important to be able to say to government, no, you can do this, because they were only hearing from industry and the US government who said, no, you can't, right? So the question of like, what are we learning in that treaty? And we were very, very important for that process. Um, so I, I think, uh, like, that was my introduction, because it matters, one, to understand what the law says. You know, are the people who made claims about it, are they right? Can you, in, in a setting of, of in, in sort of activist campaign, challenge, um, you know, that's not the right thing. And also, there's these sort of underlying justifications for the law. So the justification for the law that we were given, of course, you can't just override these categories because then you're not getting into the There, it turned out, I now teach in practice. Well, this morning, I'm seeing that practice. Like, there are these ideas that are part of how people justify these laws. And yet, we could run it on the answer and say that's true and point out that there's essentially no market for these drugs in, uh, in actually most of the global south because all of the money is in the north. And so, it didn't matter at all. There was no company that was developing these drugs because of the market in the global south. They were developing them because of the market in the north, and that was a lot of help. So, so, so it's also kind of important to get inside of those justifications some of the time because you might challenge them in the legal environments, but it was also important to tell sort of the language of politics, right? No, the South African government should do this. You're not just going to end up destroying the nation. We don't want to do that either, right? So kind of being able to be familiar with those arguments really matter. I think later on when I became an academic, I started to appreciate how some of the same arguments that were at work that we were seeing to justify this treaty and actually like scanning patents, which is something that really happened in the 80s, 90s, is actually connected to other things that are going on with labor law and banking law and corporate law and housing. And there's actually some ideas that were on the move in a lot of different kind of venues, both in courts and law schools and policy land, um, that could actually could kind of draw some strict threads between all these things. And that's actually part of what we're doing in the project. Um, but but at the time, really, I guess I, I just really was coming to the question that somebody wanted to make change in the world and, and felt that I needed to do uh, a certain amount of reckoning with these legal claims. Um, and I guess one thing, I guess maybe just to stop there, because I know we'll come back to the question of law for towards the end, is that I think it's not really helpful to see law as a bad way, because like, there are resources there that we can make use of. And of course, you can't really just get rid of it, right? I mean, this is another thing I'm going to talk a little bit about. Like it's easy if divorce was like several possible just to break up, but it's not that's not really how it works. Awesome. awesome. And thanks so much for having us. Um so I could talk about how I came to law, but it's actually a story about being three years into a humanities PhD and realizing like no one in critical theory was writing about law. And so I decided that that was something I wanted to do. But I actually don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about how law sort of came into my political life. Um and so I started humanities PhD. I go to law school in the middle, which was a strange decision. And then I come back. And it's the year that I come back uh, to graduate school is the first grad student union drive at Duke. And so we're really trying to figure out what that looks like. And we had the help of SCIU and a number of other people. And so it definitely wasn't just on me, but I was also the only grad student anyone knew who had gone to law school. And so people constantly asked me legal questions. And so it really made me aware, I think, of the way that, like something that really crystallized for me was that the other side always uses law, right? Like capital power, like that is a tool that like abs and your lack of knowledge of it is something they use against you. And so it seems like every time a grad union, um, starts to form, the first thing a university does is buy like hire a $1,500 an hour anti-union law firm, right? And so um, me and my like ability to Google and my three years of law school were not really up to the Prospero Rose sort of uh, standard, but um, it did really, I was really shocked at the degree to which they were just misrepresenting what the law said, right? Like they were saying all kinds of things that understandably were scaring people that we were trying to organize, right? And it wasn't so much that like the diehards were gonna peel off. It was instead about the fact that people who were like a little bit on the fence, all of a sudden when they were told that the tactics that we were using were not necessarily legal or that we didn't have rights that we did, that they suddenly, you know, they got cold feet. And so, um, that was the first time I was like legitimately proud of the fact that I went to law school. Um, and so I, so we lost our vote um, and we lost 
because they impounded a lot of the graduate student votes. Um, and so in many ways, it was a moment in which like the law was not on our side. Um, and we instead ended up forming a minority union and um, we really, we teamed up with Fight for 15 and we continued our campaign for living wage and we won. Um, and it wasn't everything we wanted and it wasn't, you know, it was going to start three years out and all of these things, but it, it was progress. And so it seems like I might tell a story, which is about the fact that like, you don't really need labor law, right? Like what you really need is solidarity and people banding together, especially when you consider in this particular moment that labor law is especially weak and that the Supreme Court, it seems like by the year, is just making it weaker and weaker. And so, um, and obviously I do wanna recognize that some of the most powerful strikes in the last few years have been wild strikes, but we're also in a moment where we're seeing legal strikes and, um, so the story I'm here to tell is instead about the fact that this year, the Duke Graduate Student Union held another vote. And this time they won by 88%. And that's like a huge margin. It was it was completely and totally unthinkable in our moment. Um, and why they might have done that, right? So like they had already gotten sort of the pay increase. So like what does law do in that moment? And in many ways, it just allows them to have a much stronger bargaining position. And it allowed that us to force their them to force we never really give up um uh them to force them to to bargain over everything not merely our wage um and it also grants them protections if they decide to strike um and so i don't this isn't a story about law saving the day right in fact like the duke graduate union does not have a contract and there are all kinds of ways in which labor law may let them get away with that right like, there are all kinds of things going on but it is a story about the fact that like it was a terrain of struggle it was something that like we really needed like an element um of no we needed knowledge in order to be able to push back um and that that's going to remain true right that there are going to be ways that even if it's not going to give you the things that you really need that there are ways that like really holding on to it um and, and still having those, like, so not seeing it as a limit, but seeing it instead as a tool. And I think this is something we're gonna come back to a number of times where it's sort of like, we're, I'm not here to tell you that like law is the path, that like that's the means of social change, because it's not. But um, I do think it really can be a tool for progress. Thank you. I think the, the, the passing strand in both of you are unhappy with this biographically is the, Probably with the idea of law, what set in this instrument of change, what the constraints for some in terms of activism. And we will come back to that, but I want to start with a sort of step um, before that, which is to say it seems really the way both of you talk about law, right? Like there is a, I think, uh, maybe a cliche sort of view, especially in America, you have a law, which is sort of the lawyer in a courtroom uh, and the judge, and they speak in a language which is completely you know, incomprehensible for most people. Uh, and that's sort of serious as this thing over there, right? So, but it already the way both of you weave in the story of law with your political uh, travels. Like, so, let me ask a more basic question. So, what is law? Uh, do you understand that? And how would you sort of, you know, uh, what is the definition of law or theory of law to present? Yeah, I'm gonna let you, yeah, well, just give me a couple minutes. <laughs> uh, so, this is something, of course, like you could take seminars on and law school would like to talk about this thing, you know, what is law? I think maybe I'll just name, I think, a couple of maybe uh, familiar ways of thinking about it. In law school, you might hear, and this would not be familiar to you, if you come to law school, it sound bizarre. Law is just a rule of recognition. What does that mean? It means, like, you know, that it's a rule that somebody who's allowed to recognize it as law gets to recognize it as law. That voted through Congress by two thirds, whatever, or 60%, or, you know, the Supreme Court. So I say, you know, I have a right to strike. You know, that's not law. If the Supreme Court says I have a right to strike, it is law. So it's just a rule that comes down from the right channel of recognition. That's internal to law. I think one way to think about it. I think there's another, um, another, what, what other common thing in law school that you'll hear or you appreciate if you talk to lawyers, which is law is about the rule of law. Law is law is neutral. Law is a space of reason where we come to discipline power and um, and 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 set politics aside. Right, but law is a field that does not political, but is a place of reason. 
and you were starting imagining, as I imagine the audience, uh, right there with you, instead a picture of law like 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 law on the streets uh, or the sort of TV version, like like law that is it affects every everyday people's lives, which looks nothing like either of these two things, a rule of recognition or a sort of abstract commitment to reason and um and you know that uh, reason over power. Yeah, law looks like power to most people, right? And and obfuscation of power. And I would say that's very consistent with how we in the world of law and political economy talk about law, not as neutral, not as separate from politics, but as in fact, um, um, in, in fact, uh, deeply uh, sort of shot through with power and, um, and a feature of our social lives. Um, another thing I think though that, that you were also picking up on is that one of the things we're very interested in is thinking about the political economy and how law constructs it, right? So, Political economy, we use that term in part um, because it insists on the relationship between politics and the economy. I think it's common today. Um, uh, I'm just thinking about, uh, you know, like in COVID, when people said, like, oh, the economy, like, we don't have to go back to work because of the economy. <laughs> like, the economy is this thing. It sits out there. It has its own rules. It seems to, it seems to need things from us, and we have to follow those rules. It's like a, some kind of machine. It, and part of the point of insisting on political economy is that that's not a smart way to think about what the economy is. The economy is something we construct in politics. And one of the good things about the first semester of law school, which is there aren't very many good things about it, um, but is that you will take cor courses like property and contracts. And you will learn that there's a whole lot of questions and of a million different varieties of things you could do to construct a property system. You could have a private property system. That's mostly what we have in the United States. But that's not the only kind of property system you could have. You could have common property systems. You can have public property systems, right? And you can actually sort of see once you get into the law that the way you, in some sense, Catherine Epistor has a book called The Code of Capital. The law codes capital. So if you're interested in capital, capital and capitalism, it's a set of those are fundamentally organized by a set of legal relationships. What is a corporation? It's encoded in law. It's a set of legal arrangements. Right? Uh, what is property? Also encoded in law. What is a contract? And who can do what to whom? Can I quit? Can I not quit? Who has what kind of power as the employee? As a, and I haven't even gotten to the you know constitutional rights. Right? We're we're talking about the very building blocks that most economists will just presume. Like, of course, there's property. Like they literally just skip over it. And they assume like something like property and contract and, and all of that. And then, uh, and like we just proceed from there. But in fact, when I teach intellectual property, one of the questions we have, for example, is should we allow patents on human beings, right? Where, where should we draw the line with respect to these kinds of legal rights? So law in that story becomes a kind of a, a, a connective tissue between politics and the economy. It's like a medium by which we organize the economy in ways that are not at all visible to most people, right? And to most people, that talk about the economy sounds like, yeah, like there's an economy out there and, and that's why I have to go to work. And that's why my boss can be like a shit to me because of the way the economy works. The economy is bad, right? Actually, if you think about it through the medium of, you know, the kind of political choices that constructed that relationship, you know, obviously, you know, you can change your relationship to work and law if you change the way labor law operates. Um, I mean, what the way, you know, Corinne very importantly said, like, that doesn't mean we should lead with law or think like, ah, as long as we get the, just tinker with the law as if law isn't the field of health. It's like, you know, we are, it's, it's very hard to change the law. It's not a matter of just sort of tinkering and engineering. And I think some people who go to law school think that it is like, oh, you just go and then you do your thing and you get to the, you know, you litigate or you, we'll talk more about that. So it's not to suggest that, but that, but there's a connective tissue there between politics and the economy. That's something we're very interested in in part because if you can, in fact, understand it, you can challenge it and think about uh, ordering it differently. So I'm just going to follow up because the, the second interesting theme in your answer was to say that how these things are visible to people or how law students obscure that. And kind of the, um, to use the word passion about the ideological function of the litigation um, in this regard. And the idea of law that we have as this kind of a more or less neutral technical field uh, which offers its own terms. So I want to sort of ask because this is you know partly the idea of the student also to unlearn some of the ways we think about law and you know think of it differently. So for most of us who haven't gone to law school, actually I did the law school way back, but I kind of 
forgotten. So we refresh from memory as well. Um, how does the eradicate it obscures this very important link uh, to the set? Given that we said it's structuring uh, here, economy and politics is connected to How is it obscure and what what else? Yeah, I mean, so I think to try to come in out of the academic debate, I actually sort of want to approach it from a slightly different angle um, and sort of talk about the stories about the courts that get told in law school, right? So like there are various moments where I think we see, I mean, first of all, just the fact that law schools are so focused on the courts to begin with, right? Like, so like that in and of itself gives like a very sort of like, it's a it's an art, a, a series of arguments and reasoning. I mean, so when I went to law school, um, Kennedy was still on the court and all anyone ever talked about was like how to persuade Justice Kennedy. And so that in and of itself creates like a, a, a version of what the Justice Kennedy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it really was all anyone talked about. Yeah. It's being justice. Uh, we don't have one anymore. So it's no longer a thing. Um, <laughs> So yeah, and so I've, I'll get to where we're sort of like the legal discourse is now, but I want to talk a little bit about sort of the these various places. So they, the one that now gets compared to where we are now is this era called the Lochner era. So I'm sure that you all are aware of the sort of like moment when Roosevelt threatens to pack the court, right? Like they keep striking down legislation and he uh, gets frustrated and essentially threatens to just put more justices on the court and therefore, you know, he's going to sort of dip in power. And so there's a story that gets told um, about Owen Roberts and why he decided the switch in nine or the switch in time that saved nine is just this idea that like he sort of, um, but I don't want to get into that actually. So I'm getting distracted. So what I actually want to talk about is, is the way that the sort of Lochner era. So the sort of um, 30 years, or 40 years that precede that time, sort of like how we were thinking about law and particularly law's relationship to the economy. Um, and so Lochner v. New York, which is the case that obviously the era is named after, um, was about uh, a state law that essentially put maximum hours for bakers. And if any of you have ever read uh, Marx's Capital, you probably remember the baker's chapter, like this image of people sleeping on flower bags because they have to be at work for 17 hours is something that like definitely stuck with me. Um, and essentially the court says that, no, like you can't in any way create these limitations because what you're doing is you're violating people's freedom of contract. That like ultimately it's the liberty of contract that allows both the baker and the owner of the bakery to sort of like enter into this relationship. And it's, you know, it's their choice. The state has nothing to say about it. And to do and to try to intervene in that way violates their due process, right? Because the constitution guarantees that you will receive due process before any of your sort of right to property, life, or liberty sort of gets uh impinged on. So during this era, the Supreme Court strikes down 200 pieces of state and federal legislation um, as violations of economic liberty. Um, and essentially at this point, and this is a little bit different than the current moment, it's like really sort of like laissez-faire, really just like, what we really mean is like, the government needs to stay out of it. Um, and so they struck down minimum wage laws, they struck down child labor laws, and sort of like re even regulations of banking and transportation. And so it's a moment in which the court is very much thinking about sort of like the individual autonomy in this sort of like market, right? So this is like a very particular view of how all of these things work. And so it comes to a pretty abrupt end um, in when Justice Owens decides that um, he's gonna go the other way. So the image that probably I don't know, you all are so young. I don't know. Many of you may have grown up with was of uh, the Supreme Court probably comes from the Warren Court, right? So sort of this idea of sort of like embodying liberal values and that, you know, Brown v. Board of Education, that these are, that oftentimes the court is doing something that is more protective of sort of minority rights than what's happening sort of in legislation. And so this story, um, in the Warren Court was not, perfect, but it was better, right? So like in this moment, SCOTUS is recognizing that like legal choices are not entirely, so in contrast to Lochner Court, it's not all individual choices in a market, right? All of a sudden the court starts talking about the fact that like we're sort of responsible for like people's poverty and um, 
they never go so far as to constitutionally protect people until they treat it as, as, as something that, that the law is doing wrong to them, but there's at least some acknowledgement. And then we come back, right? And so where we are now is much closer to the first picture, I did, right? This sort of idea of individual autonomy and the market. Um, and in many ways, I think about it in sort of two pieces. So one is about sort of like a blindness to the economy, right? Where they just sort of start talking as if it doesn't exist. So a good example for me are the abortion funding cases. So just a few years after Roe v. Wade, um, they pass laws that essentially say that um, you can defund abortion as long as you protect or and still protect child care under Medicaid and Medicare. And um, not Medicare, Medicaid, state Medicaid and national Medicaid. Um, and so they do that and they, um, and in many ways, it's about the fact that the court sort of says, all right, so some people can't afford it. It's not our duty to sort of like save women from their own poverty. Like that there's just because you're guaranteed a right doesn't mean you have the sort of like economic means to exercise it. Um, and then the other sort of move that we see, whether it's like the campaign finance cases or um, other things sort of going on, we see that the court is starting to say, just like it did in the Lochner era, that like democracy, like in sort of like these democratic past regulations, that those should have limits, right? That there are things that there are liberties and sort of like relationships that that they're going to protect. And I'm now going to hand it off to Amy to make this more concrete. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think I think what you beautifully illustrated is that there's a long history in the United States of this kind of um, separation of, you know, sort of walling off of the economy from, in some sense, what more attempts to render it more democratic. Like, let's have minimum wage, let's have labor unions, right? And courts have often played a really pivotal role in constructing, you know, with these cases, like, oh, no, you can't, sorry, there's this thing called the the, the right to contract, right, which they sort of construct, and they say, you know, uh, now we don't have it um, because of because of the court packing, right, the threat to the court um, to, in fact, fundamentally change its compositions because they were so obstructing um, in a time of real national crisis, um, popular legislation. Um, so, so you see this, I think, throughout in different phases, but, but you see this come back in different ways through American history, right? That there's a sort of tendency, even in law schools, we talk about public law and private law. Private law is the law of rights, uh, like contract and, and property, and sort of between persons and public law is more in the relationship to the state. As if, the, like, property isn't also a relationship to the state. And some of the most important critical legal traditions of sort of scholars and advocates who really had a role in also attacking the Supreme Court and, and, and really challenging its justifications for those decisions in the Lockyer era, pointed out some of the things that we talk about now is really central to political economy conversations, that when the law is saying, you know, this is your property, uh, uh, this is his property, and you can't go on it, the law is doing something. It's not just recognizing some natural voluntary thing back there. It's actually doing something. This is the state. The state is also here. And so you can't just say there's a land of liberty over there where the economy is and a land of state and coercion over here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but these arguments tend to come back over and over again. As I mentioned, we're back in an era where I think we're really starting, we've seen over the last several decades, the reconstruction of these kinds of arguments. And it's sort of weird where they come from, the form that they take. So I will give you my concrete example, which is a, a, a brief that I'm working on now. Um, I, after working on global access to mental health issues, I work a lot now on access to mental health in the United States. Um, and um, you may or may not know that part of the Inflation Reduction Act, one of its features was a kind of tiny little drug price control negotiation bill. So prior to this law, the government had, would buy drugs for Medicare and had promised not to negotiate the price for them. Which is weird, right? <laughs> um, but but this law changed that and said we're allowed to negotiate the price, but we're only going to do it for ten drugs and 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 many years after they've been on the market and so forth. So uh, industry actually still won a lot of things. This is really important, right? Really important, both because you know three in ten Americans say that they cannot afford and are not taking their medications as prescribed because of price, right? Um, it's a very very important issue, and the brief that I'm writing is because. Um, Pharmaceutical company, at this count, eight, eight of them 
have sued the Biden administration saying this law is unconstitutional. And you can't control the prices of medicines. You can't even have the government negotiate prices. Um, and they make a couple of arguments. Um, one argument is the one that we're focused on in this brief that we're writing, of course, which is called an amicus brief. Friend of the court, we're coming in to say they're wrong, um, and here's why. Um, as a bunch of professors, um, they say it's taking your property. And they say effectively their arguments are: we have a constitutional right to our profits, and you can't ask for that. Um, and I don't know what the courts will do, <laughs> which is why I'm writing this brief. Um, but very much on the table again is this question of like how much, how far will the courts go to to turn us back from these actually quite seismically important popular achievements that we could have, um, you know, income taxes and forms of um, uh, forms of, of regulation of prices and of industry that we can have zoning and we can have all kinds of things that we and back in the same period that for instance started you in a lot of these issues get fought out and 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 won and now there are sort of back on the table. The other kind of bonkers thing is that the companies are making an argument that that this law violates their free speech rights. And that tells you something about some of what's happened in the Supreme Um, it's it's very it's a very weird argument. I think and, and hope they will lose. But um, they uh, they are taking advantage of developments in free speech law, which um, are quite longer. So there was no right to uh, com kind of commercial speech is not protected in by the Supreme Court until the 1970s. Um, so it's really a very modern phenomenon, and now the sort of amount of protection given to commercial speech is very significant. It's something I've had to get involved with a lot because things like the FDA, which regulates what can go on the label um, for a medicine, is regulating speech according to the court now. And 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 uh, companies say, well, I have the right to say anything I want about this. <laughs> um, so so free speech law is a weird place to vote because campaign finance law. Um, you know, Supreme Court has struck down again and again campaign finance laws as a violation of free speech, the way you speak of money. Um, they struck down very important provisions that, um, that allow unions to fund their work um, on the grounds of violated free speech, and they've struck down many different kinds of regulation on the grounds of violated free speech. So, so the terrain sort of changes, but you know, it's like what do they what do the historians say? History doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Like, you know, but, but you get very similar. Um, uh, a sort of set of uh, dynamics where, once again, the sort of prerogative of those who, you know, are owners or powerful in markets are arguing and, and deploying these legal arguments to protect their power and allow them to extract, you know, what they want and, and keep their power in markets and to disable more democratic attempts to hold them accountable or to reorder what those relationships are to say, we ought to order, you know, uh, what the world is saying. You know, pharmaceutical by site, um, and and uh, and so so these are very broad questions. Um, uh, you know, to to and more. Thank you. I think the so this being blind to the economists is, is kind of the same. Um, and there's a been I guess a counter of thinking better with the historical sort of story from early uh, 20th century. Um, this I think at around the same time. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but the century is also been a counter movement among activists, among some legal scholars, law professors, right? Uh, some of the progressives, and you have to blame like Frank Roger, and then of the critical legal studies. These various ways to kind of, you know, uh, critique this blindness, unpack that, and also, you know, sort of try to structure alternative stories and uses of law in which you can you know, think about it, critique judge, judges or critiquing the structures of the way uh, law functions. Um, and I guess if you say that we are in this another new moment today by law, and I guess if LPE in some sense is a response to that moment or in that tradition of uh, thinking about law, and if that's the case, I'm wondering what is kind of you know new to this moment, it was new to kind of critique which LPs are marshaling. Yeah. Um. So I think that to some degrees we're doing similar moves, right? So like there's this denaturalizing the stories that we get told about sort of like how the world works, how the economy works. And like, obviously, so whether it's legal realism or critical legal studies, there have been traditions that um, have done this before, right? I mean, I do think that 
every critical movement has to be historically specific. So like on some level, it's new based just on the fact that like what we're critiquing is new. Um, but I also think that uh, we're less focused on the courts, honestly. It, it's actually funny that Amy and I, I don't think we've talked as much about the courts and I don't remember how long. Um, so one of the things that I feel like is really central to how LPE approaches this is that like legal change doesn't necessarily come from the courts, that like it isn't about making the smartest argument always. Like, I mean, clearly, just as Amy's work represents, you, those are important battles and we're not seeding them. And yet we are really trying to get out of the frameworks that like, this is how you change the law or this is sort of like all you can do. Um, so I wanna use a concrete example. So um, that I think highlights a, the sort of like paradigm of how LPE understands legal change to happen. Um, one, which is, about both using sort of existing powers that exist within the government, but also understanding the role of social movements and sort of like political mobilizations in that project. And I'm gonna use the example of student debt. So uh, Luke Heron, who was uh, one of the first editors of the LBE blog, um, is a legal scholar who's now at the University of Alabama. And he um, wrote a law review article really about sort of like what are, he said that for a student debt jubilee, um, using the sort of language that comes out of Occupy and sort of like the David, David Graeber moment, right? So he's like, he, he comes out of, he's in law school at NYU at the time of Occupy. Um, and he sort of like gets really invested in the idea of debt. And so he is committed, he joins the debt collective uh, or he helps found the debt collective. And then, but he also understands that they need a legal tool by which this can become a possibility. And so he writes a law review article that really sort of like, talks about how this power already exists. And then in many ways, the government is doing it in all kinds of other areas. And so it ends up getting um, picked up. Uh, so Warren's campaign is the first one. Um, and then, I mean, so a couple of things. So first of all, Biden didn't cancel anything like what Luke was sort of envisioning, right? So $10,000 is not gonna make a huge difference for many people, although a, a, huge, a, a big difference also for many, but, um, more importantly, it's like, it changed the conversation. So it wouldn't have happened without uh, the debt collectives organizing, right? So it's like, there was like political momentum around this and it became, but Luke's intervention really gave them a means of trying to think about how this could happen in a legal way. And all of a sudden, even though it's only $10,000 and it has now been struck down by the court, <laughs> um, it did, it changed the conversation, right? Now the sort of like average Democrat is not questioning whether or not debt can be forgiven. And that is a huge step. And it like, it isn't always you know, the fruits are not always there immediately, but like that in and of itself, I think, um, sort of represents how we think about these things, right? So sort of like pairing the sort of like legal piece uh, with also understanding that like, if he had just written his law review article and people weren't mobilizing around debt, nothing would have happened. And so it's really about understanding the relationship between those two things. Um, so the language we use to talk about this a lot within LPE, um, there are two. So one is the sort of non-reformist reform, which I know is coming out of a lot of particularly abolitionist spaces. Um, it originally comes from Andre Fors, who's like a French socialist 1970s. Um, but it's really the, embraces an idea that the reforms we should really be focused on are ones that change the balance of power, right? So it's like not a quick policy fix, but really something that's about shifting towards the ultimate goal, because it recognizes that if you just fix things, there's a chance you're legitimating the system. And so it's like really trying to think about the fact that like, we don't have revolution. How do we think about instead moving the ball in a way that like actually builds collective power? Um, I think the other one that comes up a lot recently in uh, LPE is this idea of building countervailing power. Um, ben Sachs and Kate Andreas, who are two law professors, um, they wrote a paper about sort of like taking the union model and trying to use it to make other kinds of sort of mass organizations of the working class and poor. Um, and they think that law has a role to play in sort of like facilitating that, right? Um, and so, just to make this a little bit, I think the easiest example for me is trying to think about like what a traditional liberal legal law reform looks like in the housing context, which is like give somebody a lawyer, right? Like 
Um, but instead of that, they are instead arguing about contrasting that to the idea of tenants unions, because tenants unions build this sort of collective power and hopefully move us towards the ultimate goal of decommodifying housing. And although having a lawyer in housing court is very important to you when you're facing it, uh, it doesn't do those things. Um, okay, so, but my job is uh, like much more concrete than that. So we're really trying to think about like, all right, so these are the big ideas, <laughs> like what are we actually doing as the LBE project? Um, do you want to take that? Um, sure, I mean, so we do a lot of things. Um, we are trying to kind of create, you know, we do events like this, we have like workshops, you know, there's sort of part of it just about developing ideas. Um, and building communities and networks. Um, there's student groups. You tell me how many there are now. I think there are 34. So student groups that have been in law schools, um, not only actually in the US anymore. And not only in law schools anymore. So we also have, yeah, uh, at various other places. So the economics department's actually at the new school. So there is one here. Um, and so, yeah. Sorry. And one of the new things we started is uh, a lawn organizing project. So we, we do a, a summer lawn organizing academy. So those who have been also focused on law students, but teaching them about organizing, what is organizing this methodology, and what are the different ways law um, uh, law can be useful for organizers. Um, and so I think very much kind of consistent with a couple of things that Corinne there was saying, sort of trying ourselves to learn and get people um, uh, to appreciate um, the way that you can um, make more powerful organizing by having some um, big critical approaches to law within it, right? So you can see how in the debt context too, it, it's almost like sometimes it's like it might, might it, you know, like you, you do need the legal argument, like how can Biden strike that student debt, but it's not just that you need the legal argument, it's sometimes like having that argument is actually how you're going to get to convince people to like come to this demonstration. There's a way we can do this, no, actually it could happen tomorrow. Right, because if you can't do it tomorrow, it's real hard to get people to come to a demonstration, right? Um, so, so I think it's really there, there's some real power to, to like working these things together. And so, in the context of the one organizing academy, we work with um, organizations like Make Your New York or um, Take Your Justice that are doing this kind of organizing work. Um, some like local New York that actually don't have lawyers on staff, but that. Um, are interested in legal change. So they're not lawyer in, in a conventional way, but they're trying to change state law. They're trying to change the law um, or municipal city law um, to organizing modalities. So we try to support programs like that. Um, and we have a blog. So if you, if any of this sounds interesting to you, you should check out our, our blog because it covers, you know, Karen and I thought that the best way to do this in terms of conversation was to talk to you about where we are coming from. Um, and so we each have our own histories. We are located in time and space, as are all of you. Um, but the blog is fun because there are many people who come at this from very different places. So, you know, they work on environmental justice. They work on the carceral state or abolition. They work on um, family policing. They work on um, that tax law, banking law, right? Um, there's actually a whole fascinating subfield that we could, we could, we could have spent a whole time talking about money. And we could, you know, what is money? Where does it come from? What do I have to do with money? What is the law of banking? Um, why are banks public franchises, right? And so the kind of some of the moves that, that are being made in um, like, you know, like it'll, they're, it, they, as it, they rhyme with other things that we're talking about, we're talking about property and so, uh, unions. Um, but, but we're, and so we're trying to sort of hold our, hold our arms around all that and help facilitate the, that, that work and, you know, teaching and scholarship, but also connected to organizing. So that's actually fascinating to sort of uh, think of this moment of critical legal thinking very much in terms of as right? and both the uh, and sort of the terms of law not as a legal dispute but as conflict about this collective action sorry uh, which then sort of I'm sorry if it's a kind of probably a bit of a cheap question but it sort of makes you think of uh, a very common sort of reaction you get in our United States and left spaces. Uh, which is to say that, you know, law is just the pure instrument of power. And it doesn't matter in some senses. If you're a left-wing activist, don't try to change the law or work for that. Because it is an instrument precisely meant to kind of you know, reproduce power. And But try to do something which is extra legal. That's where the power really lies. You know, some kind of you know, mass movements, mobilizations. Um, and actually thinking in terms of law sort of, you know, diminishes your energy and kind of forces you to engage in terms which are not favorable to uh, popular uh, politics, right? 
This is a very common sort of you know, left brain criticism of any kind of even, even critical legal thought for that matter. So I just wanted to ask you if uh, you have a response to that or a thought to that in some ways. Yeah, I, I when, as you were saying that, I was thinking about a, a very memorable moment, maybe it was about seven years ago when I was talking to Benny Charles, an organizer in New York City, and I was talking a little bit about some of what we did. And he said, we never lost a fight because we didn't have the right kind of legislation drafted. <laughs> We've only ever lost fights because we didn't have enough people. It's like, I mean, it's not wrong at some level, right? And yet, like, part of what we're trying to set out is um, uh, you need the people in the street. And don't let lawyers, you know, lawyers come in to play a role in making that harder. And that's bad. And you should be against that kind of lawyer, right? Um, one of the things that law school produces and lawyers produce is enormous risk aversion. And that can be really bad and negative. And so, but there's also a whole culture of, you know, criminal defense attorneys and labor law, like labor lawyers, who they, they understand some of these things and sometimes have to build the sort of countercultures. That's um, important to also recognize. But also, I think one thing that, you know, sort of take her as an example of the Senate Union. Like, I don't think law is irrelevant to organized groups because, you know, you can, um, you can have the ability to strike down student debt or not. Um, you can have the ability to, when you, you know, Go out there and try to make a tenancy fight you right now, and then tell your landlord that he has to recognize you. And what's going to happen? You know, and they say, no, I don't, and probably you're a victim. <laughs> like, so it'd be really nice if there was a law that prevented evictions, and it said, if you get enough people in your building to vote with you, they have to bargain with you, right? That's kind of what a tenancy would start to look like, and that's more or less not on labor needs. Now, there are really important, interesting, huge debates um, you know, among labor organizers about the relative benefits of having recognized legal protections, because some of the most radical stuff is the wildcat stuff, the stuff that is not protected. There is no union, you have no right to strike, and there's a long tradition of legalism to say the only illegal strike is an unsuccessful strike, right? If you fail, it's illegal. And if you don't fail, it will turn out. I think that's brilliant. And it it's also speaks a really important truth. And yet, you know, Labor, the labor movement created labor unions in part because they are a means of trying to sustain and project power over time. It's very hard to mobilize constantly all the time, but you need resources for mobilizing. You need, um, and you need strategies. Um, and then you also need to play defense, like as Corinne said, you know, um, so the way that we were talking about power and law would not be at all foreign to the right wing, right? Like Mitch McConnell knew what he was doing when he imposed his will on a traditional process that he violated for how Supreme Court the nominees would get appointed. And he did that because he understood the stakes. And when the when the right decides that they want people not to vote, right? Um, uh, and they're going to go after voter right, they, they have an analysis of power, right? Um, and so I think you need to also always be operating defensively um, in these terrains at least, and sometimes you can operate offensively in them. And so I think those are just a couple of ways, you know, you know writing legislation, uh, helping come up with ways to get the executive to act, um, figuring out how to sustain organizing, and then playing defense. Um, obviously, there's also a long tradition of, you know, when I went to demonstrations, you know, in, in law school, like, our National Lawyers Guild was there to help tell us what our rights were, because one of the things you want to know is, if you're going to get arrested, what do you do next? And so, you know, you need that sort of order. I feel like we should maybe open it up. I just realized what time it is. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Um. So yeah. I'll be really quick. Um. Which is just to say that I think um. I agree. Like obviously with Amy's characterization of sort of like how we're thinking about this, and um. But I also think that like. The idea of engaging with law on some level is about recognizing the world we're currently in right like that like it's everywhere around us and so even if it's not us like embracing it in a sort of like rah-rah way like there's it's something that we have to contend with and so i think that like i i take the idea i think the real danger is in legalism right where like there is a problem with like when you're a lawyer like like, and you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? Like, there's a way in which, like, they always go to the legal response, and, like, that is the problem, but I think that that's one that we're, on some level, trying to address, is to, like, again, like, just because law 
as a role does not mean it's the solution, right? Like it doesn't mean, and so really trying to get people to both take it seriously, but not take it too seriously. Now we should let them. Okay. Uh, so. Okay, so um, maybe Jay Kabla and Ms. Valerie thought to set this up because of the uh, webinar, we need to speak into the mic, the question. So maybe you can take a couple of minutes, think about you know what you want to ask, and we can set in the mic and gather the questions. Okay. You need to talk to each other about what you want. Actually, I always feel less crazy when they say my neighbor. I think we can talk to them. We'll ask them. You can talk to them. From both sides. And when I'm reading them, so so if you have a question just raise your hand and i'll come bring the mic to you Meeting with a group, maybe a couple of questions at a time, right? Just for time sake, so, or we won't lock everything one by one. Yeah, that's it. So let's take two questions at a time. Yeah. Uh, hi, good evening. My name is Daniel. I uh, just had a question about what kind of just got asking you earlier what about the uh, ugly DNA in the screen. You were mentioning about the pharmaceutical companies. Um, and I thought the press before the question about the uh, uh, I actually believe it's first as well. Um, so I would, I would immediately I'm just thinking, okay, the price controls and um, one can assume it's price controls that pharmaceutical companies will bring down in production. Um, just because for sake of okay, they're not gonna be making as much at a certain price, they're they care about profits. So they can bring down um, their production and let's say to bring it down to a level that doesn't meet the demand that actually patients need. Let's say uh, there's a there's a higher demand. Patients actually need this medication or miss various medications, but they're not producing because they don't they care about profits. What would hold them accountable? What what would happen to that instance? Cool. There's someone here. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much for, for the discussion. Um, I was just wondering, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, how law relates to social change in, in context where the rule of law isn't present? Uh, because most of your thoughts and people here usually have this kind of a bit more optimistic than I would have approach to law because we can at least depend on you know, the impartiality of the judges or the rule of law functioning to some extent, but, uh, or maybe when you're not a racial minority, at least. Um, but yeah, when the integrity of law is um, so destroyed by autocrats, and they're also using legal means, but they're also insisting on law, should democratic actors who struggle against autocrats also be insisting uh, in law in such context? Okay, we probably don't have to. Um, so I will start again with the first one. So what happens if the companies say we don't like the price control if you want to sell to you? I mean, well, Congress actually told them, uh, if you don't like our prices, then you can't sell to any of them here. And so you know, they have a lot of powers, which is that one answer, right? You can write a law that says, well, this is part of the reason the company for saying, you know, this is not fair, you shouldn't be like, calling in the courts. But if, you know, I think the way the law is written is to say you have to withdraw from all of Medicare 
um, which is the human part of something's working. So that's one answer. The other answer is because I'm somebody who can do that happens. You know, it's not that other companies can't make these things, it's that they're not allowed to because the companies have patents. And something that I've written about for my version of this of student debt, you know, is one one cool trick <laughs> you can do. Um, is that there's an existing law that says that the federal government does not um uh, cannot uh be stopped from uh violating that. Um you can afterwards you can go and get some basically some loyalty. But federal government in the 60s and 70s used to buy drugs, didn't care what buy them, right? They would go buy them you sell cheaper from Italy, they would buy drugs in Italy and say, you know, I know you have a patent, but you can't for say so whatever. Uh, and so you're only going to get a well. So actually, something that you can do um, is is to say, well, that's a law. The law is a patent. The patent says you are the only ones allowed to sell this, but I've got an exception for you. In fact, this is what in many other countries, we're encouraging countries to do, is just just defend the patent that we are allowed, let us see, and buy it from somebody else, right? And so it, it actually does work. It's happening in the world. Um, but again, that gives you a little bit of flavor, too, for how like, it matters to understand you know, with both legislation, you can try that way, or you can try these other people's arguments. Um, on the on the robot, do you want to say something about that? Okay. Oh, 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 maybe it's on YouTube. Yeah, that sounds like he works on YouTube. Okay, I mean, <laughs> you you start, and I'll add uh, anything if I have. No, I think there is no easy answer. I mean, the, a lot of the conflict conversation is, you know, a country like America, where you know, agencies have a certain kind of uh, actual power, right? But the two common pieces that I've people working on this, I know some like Yale as well, um, which is there is a very flourishing legal movement in many of these countries, right? And you say, why? Are these people the schools? And I think that kind of answer to get there is that um, it is not the same that E.P. Thompson, I think, who's a Marxist, wrote that it's not the same to just dominate and dominate through law, right? And if there's a, something about the particular form of law, right? which puts some kind of constraints on the rules. So there are a couple of ways you can play with that. So if you sort of make these legal claims and they are valid on the face of it, right? It sort of, and there's something maybe lost when the ruler basically says that, you know, I'm, I don't care about the laws, right? I kind of force them to come to that point is a kind of valuable uh, thing to do. Or at a much more alternative also doesn't work all the way down, all the time. These are scales of this. For example, you might not get some major rights uh, decisions, but you might get like a, an easier bail for some activists, right? And it's often, I think, their law at a low level uh, function. And there's a little gap which sort of might seem completely pointless from a, from a uh, larger perspective, but it really matters to activists. In a larger uh, example, anyway, they did earlier really sort of, uh, use of demonstrating the law, we have a number of them largely written in our country because it's sort of matters at that level. We're trying to think of you are uh, you know, an anarchist uh, thinking in those terms. So absolutely, so the, yes, I think the major sort of change in the regime would require mass mobilization, but there is some kind of a both an ideological and political sort of role law can play, right? Playing on that sort of constraint the form of life. I think the only thing I would add to that is also recognize one of your question is that even in settings where there is sort of very unreliable ability to appeal to law. Some people can and other people can't, right? And that's true in the United States um, and it's true around the world. And so one of the things that I think I'm quite interested in is the role of law in, in fact, um, sort of spreading some of these ideas about markets and, you know, protecting markets over democracy around the world. And, you know, I've worked on Patent Law in India and you, you might think like, you know, there's it's, it's the kind of place where, you know, not all laws are enforced, but some of them are. Um, and uh, and so, you know, one of the things you find is that, you know, that there are processes, whether this is like part of extracting of certain material relationships or part of extracting of corporate power or the connection between the two, that, you know, there are also are, sometimes you can make something, um, you can make important points about the disconnect between these two things, and you need to challenge some of the the places that that you know you may find a lot stronger than you might have thought because it's not on your side, right? Because somebody else. The next two questions. Um. Hi, I'm Michael. Um, Michael Page, and 
one of the things that really caught my attention in this subject is really how we're talking about how the law is used as a tool of power within a specific political economy, which means that um, in that sense that the law is a driving force for capital in, in one way. And so when I heard about this, talking about the law, not just in this like, court sense or this legalism sense, but also in the sense of reforming its power balance, I did want to kind of hear like, how does you know the LPE project, this approach to law, actually kind of facilitate that change? Because I, I recognize that there has been like successes, you know, in like labor and other things, but if we project that idea of like how capital move, how capital is facilitated through the law into other areas of law, like international law and treaties and agreements between different nations, the South and the West, you can still see that like facilitated form of capital in the Inequalities. Like I, I do a debate, and we're basically like arguing about the NPT with nuclear disarmament and stuff like a lot of it. And you can clearly see, you know, this is unequal. But this is the treaty that's being received in the United Nations, etc. And so I did want to hear, like, what are your ideas on what specifically, maybe concretely or abstractly, LPD helps in that approach? Thank you for doing this talk. Um, you, I think you touched on this um, briefly earlier, but I wanted to ask if you could talk more about um, bipartisanism, um, especially in the Supreme Court, um, because I'm not American, but it's always struck me as really strange how, um, like, you can just have Supreme Supreme Court judges that. You know, you know, ideologically swing either, you know, democratically. Well, it's not even ideologically, I guess just party wise, they swing either Democrat, Democratic or Republican. And you can kind of predict how certain cases are going to go, um, just depending on who's in the Supreme Court. So I don't know, it seems to me like doing law in the United States um, is more about putting people in power that you know what their ideological position is rather than making good legal arguments or making good legal cases. Um, okay, <laughs> it's a both very hard question. So the first one, um, I think on some level, maybe we gave a little bit rosier of a picture just because I think we assume that most people come into this being like, the law is not going to help us, right? That like it's not on our side. That it really is an instrument of capitalism, and it's always going to sort of protect those interests. And so, I think your question is spot on, right? Like, and I do think that uh, international law is definitely a place where you can see it um, very clearly. As far as what we're doing to address that is, I mean. Writing articles is a <laughs> but so many articles. <laughs> but I will say that, like, I mean, I do think we're on some level, like, what are a bunch of law professors really well suited to do? I mean, I think that part of it is about sort of like, I think a lot of people actually, particularly in international law, tend to have like a, a different kind of relationship and oftentimes like participate in some sort of like directly political project that's like outside of, of pedagogy. But I also think that like to some degree LPE is founded on the idea that like changing the ideas really matters. That it like makes this it like the understanding of what's possible is something that like really gets closed down and that we're trying to some degree to both like expose the way in which capital that it isn't neutral right that you're right that like capitalism is being sort of protected in these ways um and also trying to think of ways to to counteract that even if in the form of law reviews i mean i think the other thing to say is that in, in our so we don't like we're a training organization we're really looking at most of it here um but uh but but in our network of many you know faculty members students lots of people are doing they're doing their version of this thing and so i would say like i have worked on international treaties and try to both make arguments about you know the treaties and what they should, should look like and 
actually one of the very few amendments ever to a WTO treaty in from the Access Medical School event. Um, uh, they amended the treaty, which requires consensus. Um, so pretty hard to do that. Um, uh, that didn't happen without a lot of movement mobilization. So there is, I mean, I, I'm sort of joking about the one weird trick, right? But there is no one weird trick, right? And that that said, like, there is no, like, you know, so, like, we can, you know, this is just all you, I think there's that we all have a way. It's like with the Trump, you know, uh, you know, just like, just deliver us, just some judge is just going to deliver us from politics. Like, please, make it all go away, right? Um, that's, that doesn't work like that. Maybe this is really, maybe that gets to the second question, right? Um, we have to do the, the hard part of the struggle. And I think what we're trying to make the case for is that one, people who are in our different positions and, and thinking about these things can conceive of themselves as part of that and ought to be trying to, you know, um, grapple with these very hard questions and thinking about what we say and uh and, and that they can get some some role. But that doesn't mean like you know um that it happens throughout a lot of a lot of intergenerational ultimately kind of struggle. Um, on the sort of question of the courts, I think, uh, actually, I don't even know what I asked you. Maybe you want to say something about it because that was the name that's sort of working in the New York case. Um, but um, uh, I, I, it's a little bit hard for me to speak to exactly how this works in other countries because I've worked in some other countries, but not comprehensively enough. So like, I'm not going to do that, of course. Um, I guess I think it's pretty common when well, think about judges to imagine that they are sort of neutral or not ideological. Um, I think that is ultimately um, has some aspect of, of, of truth and there are good things about it. Like in, you know, in, in this country, it will be like, it's not a good argument to report like, but I'm a Republican. Like you can't do that to me. <laughs> like, so there are some ways in which um, law sort of can act can transmute some kinds of like ways that people probably say to scrap. But I also really deeply believe that judges have, they have values, they have commitments, and that's why it matters so much who ends up on courts. Um, I think mean, one way, one reason the US looks to me to you as somebody not from the US is so it's so raw is because our courts have so much power. And that's unusual, actually. We have light tenure, we have essentially unamendable computing. <laughs> Um, and that means that there can be these guys, and then those are guys on the court for 50 years, and they are particular judges, and they have particular views about abortion, about labor rights, about free speech, about corporate power matter. And that's, I think, a pretty poor design <laughs> um, in a democracy. And this is something that we are going to set through the courts to talk about, but like if you know, like I, I think it's not, um, you know, we tend to think of, of, of course, courts and judges as, as political in 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 many respects, many ways that that word means, even if not hopefully just I vote for Republican side here to do that thing in a criminal trial or whatever else. So hopefully they're doing something other than that, but they have values too. That said, I think we also should be thinking about the design of the court system and how much power courts have as um as a a, a matter that 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 put so much freight on this particular set of humans, and that's part of why um, I think there's uh, going to be so much turmoil about the courts in the near future. Yeah, I do want to throw to you, Noah, but um, yeah, I think that there's a way in which um, there's just Sometimes people ask me why we aren't just spending, like if we're going to be a leftist legal organization, why are we not doing everything and spending all of our time trying to get better judges in our courts? And like there is a role for that. But I think that as Amy's comments indicated, there's a way in which like that reinforces the idea that courts are where the struggle should be happening. And I think as a general rule, that's not where we uh, are putting our energies. That said, Noah has been doing a lot of amazing work around the New York State Court to I now want to talk about. Well, I just want to keep an eye on the clock. So either we're going until 7 30 and then we're breaking, or what's the yeah, a minute. Well, we'll, yeah, two minutes will learn. Fine. Maybe just the two things I'll say just to pick up where Amy and Corinne left us. It, it, it's just a first thing is that um, as Amy was saying, the courts in the United States have a tremendous amount of power, which makes the United States very different from other countries. It's also worth pointing out that underlying this idea of the neutral judge is a strong distinction between law and politics. I'm a legal historian by training. Historically, that distinction is incredibly problematic. And once you look outside of the federal system, you see that in many parts, that distinction doesn't actually hold. 
So just by show of hands, is anyone from Texas around here? Any Texans in the room? Okay, well, <laughs> in Texas, I was sort of. 15 years, but. <laughs> hey, the county judge in Texas is an incredibly political position and sometimes explicitly political. In many states, people are elected on the basis of partisan political affiliation. And across American history, many federal judges were picked because of their close connection to politics. One of my favorite political actors is this guy, Judge David Davis, who was an important Supreme Court justice. He was Abraham Lincoln's campaign manager, and that's why he became a justice of the Supreme Court. So I would just encourage you to think about the ideological work that the neutral judiciary does. We think that judges are neutral for a reason. If you exercise a lot of unaccountable political power, it's really great to be thought of as politically neutral. There are a bunch of us who've been organizing in New York around the courts. This is what Corinne and Amy were alluding to. Some of you may have seen the campaign for the court New York deserves, which helped lead to a different selection for one of the high judges here in New York State. I'm happy to tell you more about that, but there are political movements and organizing campaigns like this throughout the United States. There's a ton that you can do, especially at the local level, but this is all building off of the insight that we, it really does matter who the personnel are. And once you start to get that frame, that the way we understand law has political consequences, that part of what Amy and Corinne are introducing us to, the way law constructs political economy means that if you have political economic preferences, you might have to care about the law that is being used to design those. It's easy to see how that can then get you into the business of worrying about the personnel of the judiciary and so trying to build out a certain kind of judiciary. Um, can we do another round of questions or do we have to? No, I think we have a... yeah. yeah, thanks. Okay, why don't I gather, I'll gather another few questions. Yeah. That's the three, I guess. Yeah. Great. So keep your hands high up. I'll take these three questions and then we'll break. Hello, I'm Zoe. Um, kind of similar to what we're talking about here. Corinne, you mentioned um how well now we've all been discussing it, but like how the people on the court as well as important cases influence these eras of the court, which are then often like regressive of each other. Um, and you mentioned um, right post row, there was these acts like the Hyde Amendment Act and other acts that um, limited access to abortion. And then we're seeing like kind of the opposite since the overturn, many states have like embedded abortion rights in their state constitutions. And so I just wanted to ask like all of you what your thoughts are about like kind of those counter actions, not only relating to abortion, but like those cycles of the court. Um, yes, I have a question about uh, labor law and strikes. Um, and after the strike at the New School last semester, um, there was a really quite aggressive um, anti-union tactic used for work attestation. And one of the things that I think would be particularly helpful from such an organization or network that we're building would be to have some kind of um, information about the status of those forms and the strategies that might be used. So understandably, people were pretty freaked out at being asked to sign these forms. And there was a scramble to get legal advice. Um, and those tactics are now being used across many institutions and a lot of universities. So I was wondering if there's some sense of something in between the streets and the appointment of judges of some kind of, um, I don't know how you distribute it, but information that is, would be easily accessible under conditions of uh, uh, an immediate uh, strike. I'll, I'll take yeah. one more question and then yeah. we'll do another round and see if we have the time. Hi, thank you. My question is sort of related to the sort of reproductive rights, which has been touched on a little bit, but um, on birth control, because I've been hearing a lot about like the first over-the-counter birth control in the United States and how it's going to happen, and it's going to happen, and it's going to happen, and it hasn't really happened yet. And I was just wondering from a more legal perspective, why it is you guys feel that it hasn't happened in the U.S. yet, because a lot of poorer countries and a lot of 
what the U.S. would consider like less democratic countries have like readily accessible like over the counter birth control for like next to nothing. And I noticed that growing up as a kid in different countries, and I thought that was normal. And then coming to the U.S. and being like, oh, like and asking my mother like, why can't you just buy birth control over the counter like you can everywhere else? Um, in a country that supposedly has like more reproductive access than like the other countries I was talking about with my mother. And I was just wondering from a legal perspective why you all feel that is. I, I know a little bit about it, but not nearly as much as you all do probably. <laughs> um, I okay, yeah, I'll start. Um, so the question of sort of like in the post-docs moment, um, the sort of like creation, I mean, I think that uh, on some level, I can't help but see Dobbs to some degree. It's sort of like the the dog. Oh, the abortion thing. Oh yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, um, the dog that caught the car, right? Like on some level, it's like this seems like that particularly abortion was a way that uh, Republicans have uh, mobilized people to vote around the courts because that has always been sort of like that's the carrot. Um, but I do think that in in some ways we're seeing the fact that like people are reacting to, they don't need the federal constitution, right? And so like that is a right that they they can enshrine. And I think that it's been exciting to watch that kind of response. And I do think that like we see this both when the court reacts well and, and, and when it does sort of horrible things that like there is a sort of like relationship between sort of like what's going on socially. And so, um, would I like to see more sort of like organizing around uh, reproductive rights in this moment? I, I mean, I would, but I do think that like, particularly the move to sort of enshrine it in state constitutions is about trying to create something that, that really will hold. Um, do we want to go by question? I'll say a little bit about that. I mean, I guess I think um, we are facing like now an era where we're going to be commenced to organize around reproductive rights and justice questions. And we did before, but I think there was there was a way in which some of these questions had ended up getting like um, addressed by litigators. And there's a really incredibly smart group of litigators that have been doing abortion rights cases for a long time. And of course, there's something we can do they can do. But a lot of it is turned out. You know, because of the Supreme Court's decision, it's going to be turned back to questions about what, what you can do in your own state, in your own city, um, in mutual aid networks, and in organizing. And I think one of the things that I find exciting um, is the idea of trying to connect up um, the some of the sort of more mutual aid um, uh, immediate assistance with organizing. And the fact we can learn from women who have organized in other countries for abortion rights. And so that those those kinds of strategies, right? Carrying access to um, emergency contracts or other things that, that women need um, with organizing strategies, kind of like you know, bail funds uh, to get other people out and organize them. Um, those kinds of strategies I think are going to be really important um, to um, to responding. Um, I don't know the answer about why birth control um, is not available over the counter. Um, I could guess that that probably would be less helpful than what you already know. Um, uh, and then what are you just saying about the labor law? Oh, yeah. So um, the question of sort of the need for this service. Um, so luckily, there has been an organization that emerged during COVID that is trying to uh, fill this gap. And I think that the, we've been working with them to some degree. But uh, the Emergency Worker Organizing Council, otherwise known as EWOC, um, and not only do they have sort of like a lot of resources online, but you can actually call and like get them, like get an organ, an experienced organizer, and they have access to lawyers who they can sort of like help field those questions. And we think this is, I mean, it's one of the more exciting things I've seen sort of like happen in this field because again, like in these struggles, right, sort of after the moment. I feel like particularly after the moment of like initial organizing when sort of like the dust settles is oftentimes when these things come up and you oftentimes don't have the resources. The sort of like parent union isn't necessarily focused on you in the same way. And so I do think that EWOC, um, they have a website uh, and yeah, they're pretty incredible. So. You just gather the last two questions and then turn it back for our panelists to close this out.
Yeah, I guess I'm curious how you uh, view the division of your labor based on the context of how much popular control people have over the law. Some states obviously can amend the Constitution by ballot measure. U.S. is uniquely skewed towards only conservative amendments to the Constitution. Um, so if tomorrow, say, we can amend the Constitution by popular referendum, how would the balance of your work shift, do you think? Um, and is that, do you see changes in your state-level work as a result of that? Hi. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask, there was an interesting formulation described that I'm sure I'm going to oversimplify, but essentially that the economy is something you construct in politics and laws that connect the tissue through which that's done. Um, thinking specifically about social change, I was wondering from your perspective um, how culture fits into that formulation, what it drives, what is driven about it. Um. You guys asked so like me, and I'm just being like really huge guesses. Um, so I think my answer to where culture is in the story is that um, both law is uh, it also influenced by culture, like and law has a culture, and there's a kind of a um, a way in which some of the work that I do when I try to figure out like what happened to the Supreme Court's arguments about the First Amendment, for example, is watching in some level kind of cultural narratives about like what's the state, what's the economy, what do markets do, like watching them work their way into like, well, this is obviously the right way to think about what freedom of speech should be today. Um uh so I don't think of it like there being like a sort of separate field of culture and then law, right? That there are there's a sort of deep interrelationship between the three. Um uh I guess that's probably about as far as I can get in this context about there's a whole debate in law like among critical legal scholars about sort of how autonomous is law from various sorts of forces and, and culture and um and that's a very interesting debate and I guess if you're interested in that without you know developing autonomy debate in law school. Um uh why don't I stop there and you want to take the and the constitution? Yeah, which I can't imagine why you um okay. So I think this is a great question because I do think in many ways a lot of how we think about what we're doing is based on the idea that we have to sort of function within this existing framework. Um and it's interesting that the only people right now sort of like calling for a constitutional convention are on the right. And so like unfortunately it it may be a very scary version of this question that we have to confront sometime soon. Um, and so I think that it might shift us more towards like directly sort of like political mobilizations. I'm not, I guess I'm not totally sure. I do think that yeah we're so used to thinking about so many of the structures as being us trying to sort of like work within that. I mean, I, I one thing, because I got to stay well in this chat, that I would say about that is that I think, one, I would say it will possible to easily amend the Constitution. And if the thing the Constitution mentioned is called, like the right figure so ahead and do it, uh, we will have to think about that. And I think, you know, what, what would we like to see in our Constitution? What it made me think of uh, is the process that in South Africa during apartheid that the ANC created this process that they called the Freedom Charter, where they actually didn't ask ordinary people, what would you like to see? And what emerged from that is a very beautiful constitution, right? Health and right? Health, health, right? Food. Um, now, I don't know if you've been to that, <laughs> but um, I think it's both like, it's a really worth thinking, what would you like to have in the constitution? And it will not solve our politics. Like to have all the best things in a constitution, because the same way that politics is working its way through the what is the first minute, it's like, pretty good, pretty sweet. Wait, pretty sweet is the right to not have like race control? Like, what? Um, you know, it's not, they're not, it wouldn't, um, I think, be an end to a process of um, uh, liberation or, you know, um, uh, uh, social change. It would be part of it. And always subject to further um, uh, further change that um, you know would have to also be. We have a sort of tenting in and current for you know, the extraordinary so wide ranging insights and law, but also sort of setting us up now for all the future uh, discussions we have. 
but I think that it's very clear, you know, this main theme that English will come back in all our discussions during this uh, period, which is about, you know, to what extent laws are constrained, how we shape power, what kind of scope it gives us with a free account of power. Uh, so thank you very much for this. Um, so the idea we have is to have this session every first Thursday of every month, sorry, uh, during then in semester. Um, so we will have the the next one would be November fifth, right? Or something like okay, I've checked. November fifth or second, which is a Thursday, uh, and we'll have the details of the panel out soon. So thank you very much. I hope you'll come back. Um, and we hope this will be an interesting conversation for us. Thank you. Um, okay. 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 Um, okay